Hi, thank you for welcoming me uh, here in Singapore. Um, my name is Yuki. Uh, today I'm going to talk about digital mean experience and beyond. Uh, this is me. Uh, my name is Yuki Nishijima. Um, you can find me on GitHub and Twitter. And, and I think yesterday I met a uh, called me Nishida-san, which is actually <laughs> not the right one. Uh, my family name is Nishijima, uh, so I wanted to ask him, did you be Nishijima? <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, this is me. Um, uh, this is me on GitHub. Um, I work for, um, I'm the creator of Digimin Jam. And, and I also maintain a Kaminari Jam, which is a Rails partner Jam. Um, I was born in Japan and live in New York right now. And I also used to live in, on, uh, in the Philippines before. And then I actually came to Singapore for Red Dot Ruby Conf in 2011 and 2013. And I'm really excited uh, to be here as a speaker this year. Um, I work for a company called Pivotal Labs. Uh, Pivotal Labs is an agile consultancy that helps build software with agile practices, like uh, pair programming, TDD, stand up, things like that. And I think some of you uh, already know Pivotal Labs before, because we, there used to be a branch in Singapore. So this is stand up, pair programming, and ping pong. <laughs> We're going to also open a branch in Tokyo this summer. So if you are interested in working with us, just let me know. All right. Um, so let's talk about today's main topic, uh, digital mean experience. Um, Matt actually uh, talked about it yesterday already. But um, let me just give you a quick introduction, because uh, some of you mightn't have used it before. So let's say you want to check if a string object starts with a specific letter. So maybe you can use a start with method. But actually, it doesn't work, because it only responds to start with, not starts with. And it often happens because you're not using rails, and more specifically, um, active support. And because active support has an alias to start with. But if you use Digimin Gen, as soon as you get an error, it will automatically look for what you really want it to call and then suggest it to you. So you don't have to uh, waste your time. Like, you don't have to Google. You don't have to go to like, RubyDoc. It's going to just look for what you really want it to call. So since last year, I started getting uh, many questions about this gen. Um, and one of them is like, um, it's great. But sometimes it doesn't correct when it should. Like, for example, uh, you typed a, you typed like a long method name, and then you realize that uh, it's not, it's not just you just don't remember the correct one, and then did you mean fails to search for it, and then sometimes it displays too too many connect corrections, and because it's not super smart, so sometimes like for example Rails path, and then you typed uh, like API something something and then path, and it's gonna search a lot of things. And another example could be, uh, I misspelled a table name in the database. And then Digimean just doesn't suggest it. This is actually interesting, because Digimean is designed to work with name error and nonce of error. But if you type uh, like a column name, table name, then Digimean doesn't actually suggest anything. So let's learn about, let's learn about how to write a spell checker in general first so that you can, you can understand easily. Uh, this is not actually about Ruby specific topic, but it's about computer science. And the history of building a computer spell checker is actually quite long, even longer than my age. Um, so let's learn from the history so that you can easily understand how it works. So first of all, mm -hmm. so what's a spell checker? Uh, basically, it behaves like a function that takes a user input like this. And obviously, the input is uh, what, what people actually typed. And the input usually has noise. Like, you make a typo, you, may, uh, you misspell something, and you don't remember method name. So basically, it is just noise. <clears throat> and the spell checker gives us the output back, uh, which is what is most likely to be intended. So it is actually pretty simple. Um, it takes an input. It gives us back the correct one. But what's inside the bullet box in this case? So usually, a spell checker consists of three things. 
the first one is dictionary, uh, which is basically just a set of words. The second one is control mechanism, which decides what to return as a correction. And the last one is optimization. And technically, a spell checker can work with, uh, only with a dictionary and a control mechanism, uh, but usually some optimization techniques are applied to improve um, spell checker, like performance, accuracy. So what is dictionary? Again, it is basically just a set of words, and it usually comes from, a, from an actual dictionary, which is why it is called dictionary. And a spell checker can have a multiple set of dictionaries, uh, for example, sometimes also spell checker can have both uh, Oxford dictionary and then sometimes Wiktionary, uh, which is available on the web. And sometimes even more. <clears throat> and this is because every single dictionary out there has different characteristics, and then one dictionary can't always cover everything. For example, British English is a bit different from American English, and uh, you want to implement a spell checker that can correct both. Or sometimes it shouldn't, because for example, optimization has sometimes Z, sometimes S, and if you were in America, then the space checker shouldn't suggest that. And then another example could be um, space checker for Japanese. Uh, I think this is also true for other languages like Chinese. Uh, but the reason why it needs multiple dictionaries is that uh, it is typical that when you're writing Japanese, um, you always use English words. And then you probably need two different dictionaries so that uh, the spell checker can correct um, even English words um, while you are writing something. The next one is control mechanism. Um, mathematically, it is just a formula. It usually checks uh, whether or not each one of the words in the dictionary is, is the right one. A spell checker can have multiple formulas because one formula doesn't always cover everything because of the same reason as, a, as why dictionaries can't. And since it is just a formula, uh, some metrics must be calculated based on the user input and, um, and the words in the dictionary. Uh, there are many types of metrics out there, like um, <clears throat> you can calculate similarity between two strings with Lubinstein and Yellow Winkler and Humming, and there's a lot more. And then naively scanning all the words in the dictionary will be painfully slow because, let's say English, uh, there are like four million words, and then you, don't, you really don't want to scan everything because it takes time. So optimization, uh, it basically improves performance or accuracy, and sometimes both. Uh, there are many, many, many optimization techniques out there, but they're actually just they're usually context specific. Like, for example, this spell checker has an optimization technique, but if you have another one, then this one can't use the other one. But it's really powerful because it really, often, optimization is what makes spell checkers great. So I think uh, we really should. <coughs> so, we don't, so if you are writing a spell checker, then you really should optimize. Now, let's take an example. Let's take a look at uh, some examples. Um, obviously, the second one is wrong. Uh, they were troubling. And it is, it is easy for humans to choose the right one. Yeah, it is clear that word is the correct one. But for computers, it is really hard to choose uh, which one is the right one because computers are not smart. And in this case, you can just implement some kind of grammar analysis because uh, word can come between trouble and trouble the day and the travel, but where can, can stay in the middle of the day and the traveling. Another example would be something like this, and then this sentence looks really weird, but space checkers are not only for humans. For example, if you talk to Siri, it can reconnect the difference between no as a verb and no as an answer. In this case, you can just um, <coughs> create a dictionary for, for the same sound of a word. And then, so that spell checker, spell checker can pick up the right one. Now we know that a spell checker can um, have three things, uh, dictionary, control mechanism, and optimization. So what's the dictionary of the Digimi gem? And then what control mechanisms does it use? And are there any opti optimizations in it? The dictionary of the, of the gem is simply just a list of symbols. 
and, it, and it, cal it calculates living sin distance for each word in the dictionary and then and I use the input and then suggest the ones that are within the threshold. So what is living sin distance? It is actually quite simple. Let's say you have uh, two strings. Um, in, the, in the previous example, we talked about start with and it starts with. So here you can see it starts with and it starts with. And obviously, there's a one character difference uh, between them. Uh, the S letter between T and under, uh, which means you, if you remove one letter uh, from, the, from the second one, then they, they will be identical. That means the Livingston distance will be one. Now let's take a look at this example, first name and full name. Obviously, there's a uh, three, three letter difference as well as one extra letter in first name. So the Livingston distance will be four. And in Digimin, Jan has uh, just one optimization, which is a context-based dictionary. Um, I'm not sure if I should call it an optimization because this is what I did since the beginning. Uh, but basically, you can, if you want to get all the list of the um, names, then you can just call symbol dot all symbols. And so how many symbols are defined in a Ruby process? If you, if, as you can see there, um, there are about uh, 2,500 symbols, if you just call it um, with Rubicon, put symbol, all, all symbols and size. So how many symbols are defined when you just do Rails, uh, Rails new, and then Rails default, RakeDB migrate, and then Rails C? Uh, I'm going to ask you guys, uh, raise a hand if you think it's 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000. <laughs> okay, so the answer is uh, about 20,000 symbols which is quite a lot because <clears throat> every time you get an error, you really don't want to scan 2,000 words because it takes time. And as you can see here, the number of the methods available are relatively small. Like for, for string, we have um, 26 methods for one array. We have 20, <clears throat> two, 246 methods and for one hash, uh, 236. And for user model, um, it has uh, about 600 methods, and, then, and a user object has about 400. So um, every time you get an error from like hash, it doesn't have to <coughs> scan all the symbols, which is about uh, 20,000. 20, In this case, you can just scan about 20, 50, <coughs> 200 methods. And Digimean Jam uses a pattern called find a pattern. That means, um, <coughs> for example, you get a name error and it says initialize constant, then it's going to use constant finder, which only knows about the list of constant names. And then if, it's, if the error is known of error, then the method is going to use non method finder, which only knows about method names that you can call. So this is how Digimean Jam works. Um, and this is actually the late, how the latest version of Digimean Jam works. And, um, but um, it's actually different from um, the one that is available on GitHub. Now we, now we know um, how it works, <clears throat> but uh, we don't know how accurate it is because um, Sometimes it doesn't suggest it. Sometimes it suggests too many, too many methods, and we want to know how accurate is it. How are we going to do this? Uh, we can't just test it with Ruby symbols because it's hard to collect uh, typing data while you're programming. So I'm going to just use uh, existing um, data that, are, that is available on the internet. And <clears throat> I'm going to use um, Wiktionary Simple English as a dictionary. And simple English is a dictionary that only uh, contains essential English words. 
uh, because uh, Wiktionary also has a, has a whole English dictionary, but it has four million words, so I don't want to use it because it takes time. And then while you're programming, I don't think we use uh, really, really hard, hard to remember words <laughs> because uh, you want to make it simple, and so that, which means you only use essential words. I'm going to also use um, a list of correct and incorrect pairs from um, Birkbeck uh, spell, Spelling Error Corpus. Um, there's all this study, and then and that data was used by that study. And everything is available on the web, so I'm going to upload this slide later so you can check them out. And this is the result of the evaluation. As you can see here, the accuracy right now is about 54%, which is actually not high. So why is it low? Uh, what kind of names can the spell checker not correct? I've seen many cases where I remember a method name incorrectly, and the correct spell checker doesn't, the current spell checker doesn't catch it. So let's just optimize it. And you may already realize it, but sometimes I say mistype, and then sometimes I say misspell. And then they are actually different. A study said that spell correctors that can correct mistypes can't always correct misspells. And it is easy to correct mistypes because it, you, can just you can just calculate at a distance with Lubin's 10 distance. And then if you just make a typo, like for example, you try to hit A and it accidentally hit S, then there, there will be just a one character difference. And then that's we check, spell checker can correct that mistake. But when it comes to uh, like spelling mistake, like you don't remember the method name correctly, and you are stuck. No, you don't know how to type, and then the other, <clears throat> and you don't know how to type, and you try to guess, and then, but it doesn't always uh, <clears throat> catch the right one. And the other study says that um, you always rem remember uh, the first part of the method name, uh, not method name, just, just names in general. Uh, like yesterday, Matt uh, called me Nishida-san, but he remembered uh, the first part of my, my name, but didn't rem remember the last one. So I, I guess it's a good example. <laughs> and now it's time to use yellow winkler distance, sorry, uh, yellow winkler distance. Um, uh, what is yellow, yellow winkler distance? It is basically uh, yellow distance plus prefix bonus. Um, there's another distance metric called yellow, and then the prefix bonus has been added because you always remember the first part of the uh, name. And if you add a prefix bonus, then you can, you can pick up the, <coughs> the right one because uh, it has bonus. So what is yellow distance? Uh, there are two important metrics, uh, M and T, and uh, the first one is uh, the number of matching letters, and uh, the second one is half the number of transpositions. Take a look at this example. Um, here you can, you can find a uh, first name, and uh, the second one has, uh, has a wrong um, character. And to calculate M, it checks if the letter appears in the, first, in the other one. And here you can see just four arrows, and then the question is, does it actually have to scan everything? And the answer is actually no, because it has matching window, which means, let's say you, ha you have two long uh, strings, and then the first one has uh, character A in the first plate, and then the second one has character A in the last one, but it doesn't make sense if you, <clears throat> if you combine these two things, because it's too far. So we don't have to check these ones. And as you can see, every letter here appears in the other one, which means the matching number will be just 10. And there are two transpositions, meaning um, T, it's gonna be just one, because it's gonna be half number of the transpositions here. Now we know M and T. And you can calculate the distance with this formula. And it's going to be uh, 0.966666. X. The next thing we have to do is to calculate uh, prefix bonus. To calculate it, it, 
it let's only care about the first four letters in the strings. So let's forget about the rest. Um, we only know about the first four. And check if, if each, one, each one matches the, the other one. And obviously, the first one matches, but the second one doesn't. And even if the second one, second one appears in the third place in the other string, um, it should stop counting if it doesn't match. So in this case, I should appear in the second place, but it doesn't. So it should just stop counting, which means in this case, the prefix uh, match is, is going to be just one. And we're going to use this formula to calculate bonus, um, where w is uh, weight. Uh, usually, it's 0 0.1. And an np is number of prefix matches, which is just one. And then here, yeah, j is yellow, yellow distance, which means the prefix bonus is going to be 0 0.0033333. And since yellow winkler distance is just yellow winkler plus prefix bonus, we can just uh, combine these two. So we're going to get 0 0.9.699999. <coughs> so yeah, um, as you can see, they are pretty close, which is why we get a um, value which is, which is really close to 1. If everything's the same, the yellow winkler distance is going to be just 1 because, <coughs> because they are same. Now let's talk about the misspell correction in Digimin Jam. Uh, it uses Digimin distance and then picks up the closest one only if no mistype corrections are made. And in a Livingston distance, and in a Livingston distance, I'm sorry, distance should be lower than the length of the shorter distance because um, sometimes yellow winkle distance could be really high even if it, the Livingston distance is really, um, really high. Um, so uh, Rubinstein distance should be low, and then be, otherwise it's going to suggest something uh, that is not related. Now let's read the evaluation. Um, we can use the same script and how, uh, how much it, it is improved. And now it's actually better. The accuracy increased by um, about 7%, and then and that's about 80% accurate, which is great. But, it's, but it's, it is also true that 20% of the time it is wrong. So what are the corrections that didn't go well? Uh, this is just one of them. Phase, fate, and phase. Uh, the reason why they are misspelled is that um, they sound quite similar. So like for example, if you say fate, then somebody thinks that, oh, it is F-A-Z-E. But it's actually wrong. But um, both Livingston, Yellow Winkler, Distance, cannot catch it because the distance is quite low and, 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 um, and the first character is actually different. And then the another example like this, female, email, female. And then night, unite, night, same problem. And then the last one, uh, this is interesting because it always happens to me. Like, you really don't know it is S or uh, C, and then I don't know like how many S do I have to type, how many Cs do I have to type. It's really confusing. But as we can see, most of the errors are coming from the fact that they sound, they sound quite similar, but has different letters like C or S, uh, PH or F. In other words, if I have to improve the Digimin Jam uh, even more, I should probably apply a, like a pronunciation-based um, pr optimization. Now let's talk about uh, writing a finder. Uh, this is the last section of this talk, but yeah, it's really great. So <clears throat> the reason why uh, you want to write a finder is that let's say you have a you're writing a Rails app, and then sometimes you want to implement a finder like this. For example, use uh, active, active record and then mistype uh, attributes name in the database and you will get unknown attribute error. But it doesn't correct our mistake because it's not name error, it's not norms of error, so it doesn't know about how to correct uh, this, how to correct the uh, mistake here. I want something like this. So I'm gonna mistake in the, in the hash, and then it should suggest a name so that I can easily realize that um, I'm doing something wrong. 
as I talked earlier, DigiMeGen has a couple of finites by default. But you can also add a new one if you want, which is great. So let's just implement it. Here you can see a class called attribute name finder, which includes DigiMe base finder. Um, I'm not actually sure if it's a good name. I should probably change it to something else if I come up with a new one. Uh, and what you really have to implement is just two methods, uh, initializer and switches method. The initializer takes an exception object, and then you can grab uh, things like a binding object and a original message. And then what's important here is that you really have to call original message because this finder is evaluated while it is trying to generate a message. So if you call just message, then it's going to be stack overflow error because it tries to generate a message, it tries to call the finder, it tries to call the method, so it's not good. So it's really important to call original message. And then a certain method should return a hash where the key should be a user input and the value should be a dictionary. And since it has to respond to attribute method, uh, sorry, attribute name and then column length, then you can just implement like this. Attribute name uh, was, is coming from the uh, original message and then column length uh, is coming from uh, column length. So here eval uh, self class is actually a uh, uh, act record object, and uh, if you say column names, you can get a list of names. And don't forget to add a new finder to the list of finders. So before we get something like this, but if you, <coughs> after you implement the finder, then uh, you're going to get something like this, which is great. Uh, it is available on GitHub, so check it out. <laughs> So yesterday, as Matt said it, uh, it's going to be bundled uh, when Ruby 2.3 is coming, coming out. But um, there's still a lot, a lot of things that I have to do, like removing support for other MRIs, JRB, Ruby News. Um, if, it, if, it should be, if it's gonna, it, it is going to be bundled as, a, as part of Ruby, then it shouldn't know about JRB. It shouldn't know about Ruby News. It shouldn't know about old Rubies. It shouldn't know about Rails, Bundler, Ruby Gems. And then the next thing uh, I have to do is um, stop monkey patching. Uh, right now, Digimean Jam has a monkey patching, and also a C extension. And then <coughs> I'm expecting the next version of Ruby, Jam, uh, Ruby, Ruby version to, in to include the extension. And also, hopefully, I don't have to do monkey patching anymore. So, so yeah. Uh, there's still a lot, of things, a lot of things that I have to do, but hopefully I can ship it with, with the next version of Ruby. And then one last thing I want to tell you today is that DigiMuseum totally works with emojis. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much. Uh, we have time for a couple of quick questions, if you have any. If you do, please come up to the mic. Hi. Thanks for the speech. Um, I have a question. I'm trying to implement TF IDF. The problem I face is with the, TF, uh, with the IDF, whereby uh, I'm trying to look for a corpus with the document frequencies. And also, if I get it, because it's quite large, how, what data format would I best put it in to actually do a fast query? Uh, can I say again? So your question is, uh, you want to implement the finder, but you want to change the format? I'm trying to implement TF-IDF, uh, whereby it tries to find the importance of a word in document. So I'm trying to find a good corpus. And also, mm. if I find it, how would I best uh, store it so that I could do a quick query. <laughs> um, I don't know, actually. Um, <clears throat> what I can think of is to implement like Vim plugin or Emacs plugin or Ruby my plugin to automatically capture what you typed and then send it to somewhere else so that you can correct, uh, you can collect uh, like what you type and what you actually mistyped or misspelled. 
So yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question because I use uh, some, um, some covers that, are, that is available on the internet, but it is used like back in 1980, like, and it, it could be really old. So yeah, so the, the uh, evaluation script is not actually good enough. Okay, thank you.